Good evening. Good evening. It's, it is really exciting to be here. Um, I'll have to say that I am a bit humbled to be among the people whom you've had as the Gamble lecturer when I looked at that list. And indeed, I, I told my son that that's what I was going to be doing here at UMass. And then he looked at the list, and then he sent me a text, and he says, and you? <laughs> that's what happens when you know me. <laughs> Uh, it's also a kind of special thing uh, to be here uh, because my second job interview after I got my PhD was here at UMass Amherst. So forgive a little stroll down memory lane. Um, it was 1981 and it did not go well. Sam Bowles and someone else in the department, I don't quite remember who it was, got into an argument on my second and third, like power, in those days it wasn't PowerPoint slides, it was overhead slides. And I never really gave, regained control. <laughs> so I, I thank you for the opportunity to redeem myself. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that happened is it, it, it's, it's now something that most graduate students know that, that this could happen to you. But in 1981, as a black woman in economics, no one actually really gave me much advice. I had to figure it out on my own. Now, when Patrick asked me to be your lecturer this year, my initial response was, well, you know, I don't really talk economics anymore. I talk about philanthropy. And as soon as the words came out of my mouth, I heard the absurdity. What is the definition of economics in most introductory textbooks. It's economics is the study of how scarce resources get allocated among competing alternatives. And what have I been doing for the past almost 11 years now? I have been working on how I can get a scarce resource, philanthropic dollars, allocated to better uses than it has in the past. So in fact, even though I am now more than a, a practitioner than an academic researcher, I'm actually very much involved, more deeply perhaps than maybe, maybe when I was academic dean, I was also involved in the same way. But I'm very much involved in really what is fundamental to the practice and theory of economics. And my work is heavily informed by both the economics of philanthropy, but also by the history of my own research, which focused on racial and gender equity. So what I'm going to do today is that in this evening's lecture is to talk about a case study, a case study that is lever for change, where I want to ask a basic question about the nature of philanthropy, and the nature of the extreme concentration of wealth that we now see in society. And really, the big question I'll be asking is whether philanthropy can be deployed to mitigate the consequences of this concentration of wealth. Lever for Change focuses on ultra high net worth givers, so that will be the primary focus of this conversation. But as I said earlier, and, and maybe I take a moment and just define an ultra high net worth individual for you, their definition that is being used in WealthX, which is one of the major data sources on this, are people whose net wealth is 30 million or more. That puts them, if you look at the top 1%, the top 1%'s median wealth is around 10 million. So 30 million or more puts you at a, a very upper echelon overall. Although some of the people we work with are actually less wealthy than that. So now staying true to what I learned all those years ago in my job talk, I'm here are the takeaways that I hope at the end of the evening you will remember. The first is that while private philanthropy has the potential to mitigate the consequences of the growing concentration of wealth, the current pattern of giving 
among cultural high net worth individuals is not getting us there. It's not doing that. It might even be amplifying the consequences of this concentration of wealth. And the problem really has two parts. One part is that they're not giving away nearly enough, enough and that's part of what I'm trying to fix. But there are also issues with the choice of where and how they give. The second takeaway that I hope you'll take from this evening is that it is possible to shift donor behavior to be more equity enhancing. Lever for Change, the nonprofit that I founded five years ago, has facilitated, in the introduction it says 1.7 billion, we're now over 2 billion, I'm really proud of that, in philanthropic gifts to organizations and projects focused on social change, most of it coming from living high net worth donors. Many, much of that funding is flexible, that allows organizations the opportunity to implement the strategies and solutions they have defined. And we are beating the market on many metrics. But I want to note that our ability to shift philanthropy is not a justification for the extreme concentration of wealth or an argument against public mechanisms to redistribute it. And the fact is, and this is the third point, we could be a lot better at what we are doing if we understood more the behavior of ultra high net worth individual decisions about where to allocate philanthropy. We could use more research. And so my third takeaway will be an invitation, particularly to those who are graduate students or undergraduates here, to focus more on this topic area. We could use more research by economists and other social scientists on donor decisions about where and how to give, more analysis on changes in public policy that might accelerate shifts in giving. One of the questions that really is a particular focus of mine is this issue of larger donors. And while there is a body of work in the economics of philanthropy, most of it is just focused on a couple of questions. One question has been the impact of the charitable tax deduction, again, just focused on the total volume. Another has been experiments on what induces people to give, trying to understand individual motives for giving away their money. And there are some very interesting group of experiments that have been done, but they've been done with college students, which is where much of this experimentation happens. Um, and it's not necessarily representative of what we might expect from really big givers. There's a couple of e exceptions, a paper on delegating altruism, which explores whether or not ultra high net worth people would be willing to give their money over to the control of an algorithm to decide whether they would use their, how they would, gifts would be used, and work that suggests that no, they won't because they want a lot of agency over their gifts. So there's still a lot of space there. Let me now just turn to why all of this matters. Ultra high net worth philanthropy can substitute or supplement for public sector provision of goods and services. And this has its upside and its downside. So for example, one case in point is the Kalamazoo Foundation for Excellence. Have any of you heard of that? The Kalamazoo Foundation for Excellence? All right, this is really, really kind of an interesting experiment that's happened. Where in the city of Kalamazoo, um, there were issues about how well people were, there. some of you may have heard of the Kalamazoo Promise, there was a commitment to every graduate of Kalamazoo High School would have their college tuition paid for. Despite that commitment, there were still huge disparities by race and first gen st status in terms of who was taking advantage of it and going to college. There was a recognition of a need to perhaps invest a lot more in various social supports within the city, but no political will to, run, to raise the property taxes in order to do that. So what happened is that a group of philanthropists founded this foundation, and the foundation was set up under the principle that property taxes would be capped and not raised, but instead these philanthropists would flow fund, funding into the foundation to basically fund the city. 
So this raises lots of questions about what it would mean if indeed we transferred completely a lot of the responsibility for the delivery of public goods to individual philanthropists. That's embedded really in what the tax system currently does when we have the charitable de deduction for philanthropic giving because it is diverting funds that would normally be in the public coffers and letting private individuals make those decisions. And one of the things that's noteworthy about that charitable tax deduction is that particularly with the recent changes that have been made in it, it is a sort of regressive practice because the big benefits come from those who are the richest and for more moderately income people, it may not make sense to take it at all given the size of the standard deduction. But one of the positive arguments for the Kalamazoo Foundation for Excellence is a second role that private philanthropy can play in an economy like ours. And that is that public expenditures are usually give, governed by a political process. And most of you may be familiar with the idea of a median voter model. And this is the idea that when you have a process that's determined by the number of votes, elected officials are gonna gravitate to meet the needs of the median voter in that particular community. But th what that sometimes means is that those voters who are not at the median or who may exist on the fringes of that community never have their needs addressed. Perhaps the most extreme version of this was in communities in the South in the early 1900s where there was a huge disparity in the provision of public schooling between white and black children. And one of the more famous examples of private philanthropy stepping in Julius Rosenwald of Sears and Roebuck, which I'm looking in the audience, probably most of you remember Sears and Roebuck, <laughs> uh, spent most of his fortune, in fact, all of his fortune, he spun down his entire wealth on creating schools for black children in the South, some of which produced Maya Angelou and John Lewis were both graduates of Rosenwald schools. Private philanthropy can also act as society's risk capital. Rob Reich, who's one of the major commentators on philanthropy, political scientists, notes that because of their size and longevity, foundations in particular, can operate on a different and longer time horizon than can businesses in the marketplace or elected officials in public institutions who frequently need to see results from something before the next election. So private philanthropy has the opportunity to play a major role in society by taking risk on social policy experimentation that we wouldn't routinely see from either the private sector or the public sector. One of the primary examples of that at present are the universal basic income experiments that are underway in various parts of the country, which are also almost exclusively being funded by private philanthropy itself. Private philanthropy can also support an independent sector of organizations who hold government and the private sector accountable, or that organize and activate and communicate citizen voice. One of the examples of that that I think about is if you go back to um, Not Safe at Any Speed, which was a book that was published, it made Ralph Nader's name. This was private philanthropic money that supported that research that ultimately led to the introduction of a lot of auto safety laws. And there is an emerging sector of organizations focused on accountability now in the context of AI and privacy in the internet, in the technology sector. Also, it's worth noting that private philanthropy funded the Black Lives Matter movement. And this was a particularly interesting case because much of the funding came from a group of young people who were legacies of people who made money in the past, and they felt a particular uh, obligation to step in and formed a group and started quietly funding much of that work. 
Private philanthropy, on the other hand, also funds the Heritage Foundation. So it's, you can cover the whole gamut there itself. And then it's possible that private philanthropy could be a more direct and flexible mechanism for redistributing wealth or mitigating the consequences of wealth inequality. I've already mentioned the universal basic income experiment, but one of the other sort of, of, of places where private philanthropy has really sort of embraced is the work of Give Directly, which emerged from research that a graduate student in economics did that compared what happens when you give people direct cash transfers versus what happens when the money flows through as foreign aid and other types of interventions in communities and found better outcomes through direct cash than through the uh, other kinds of programs that attempted to uh, increase the status of individuals in these, in these communities. Give Directly is now a benchmark for a group of philanthropists who call themselves the effective philanthropists. Now, some of you may be familiar with the concept of the effective altruist. Sam Bakeman Freed and all of those groups. I'll mention that because the effective altruist is a group who believes that they're, the, best thing, the best thing to do is to make as much money as you can. And then the idea is that you're going to spend it on philanthropic activities. Effective philanthropists are, are connected but not the same and that their focus is maximizing the impact per dollar they spend. And they rely very heavily on studies done by economists and others about the impact of particular interventions to do that assessment. But the way they have structured their giving, they give advice, they have a website where they give advice out to philanthropists, is that they compare every intervention to give directly. And so when they, every year they get funding given to them by philanthropists to redistribute. If they can't give it to, if they haven't found something they think is cost effective enough, then all of it goes to give directly itself. Private philanthropy also deservedly has its critics, quite vocal critics. We've had this increase in wealth inequality coupled with a decline in giving and increases in, in, which results in an increase in the power and influence of the wealthiest. The decline in giving, and let me just go for a moment. What this graphic shows is the percentage of households who are giving to nonprofits over time. And this is of all households. And so what you see is a, a, a decline over the past really 10 years or so, there has been a steady decline. And that's continued even past that. And this decline is a, raises flags for a number of reasons. One is that there's questions about what it means for social capital in society. Is it a sign of increased polarization and so on? But another aspect of it is that it's mostly been a decline among what we might call the everyday giver. And those are people who are middle income and so on and who are giving perhaps to their churches on Sundays. There has been a big decline in religious giving. Uh, they may be giving to the local boys and girl club in their neighborhoods, but that has seen a secular decline. In the meantime, the giving from the ultra high net worth individuals has either held steady or increased. And so now we're in a world where increasingly the nonprofit sector is being supported by those who are the most wealthy in society. And that increases their power and influence over both the activities of the nonprofit sector and the allocation of public resources. I mentioned earlier the tax, charitable tax deduction. The great least, most recent estimate from the Tax Policy Institute is that that deduction will reduce tax revenues by 51 billion in 2023. And as I noted, these are funds that are diverted from public purposes. And the allocation of these funds instead gets determined by the individuals, private individuals and institutions rather than through a democratic process. And it's worth noting as well that the decision makers 
the wealthy and their delegates, the staff of many of these foundations, are not representative of the general population and have no accountability to that population. In fact, just on a personal note, one of the big surprises when I left my career as an academic and moved, into the, and moved to the MacArthur Foundation was the recognition that there were no students threatening to occupy my office, there were no faculty who were saying that I wasn't representing their interests sufficiently well with the administration. There was no, there were no, there was a board of trustees, but their role was completely different. It was very much just an advisory role overall. And so I started wondering, okay, well, wait a moment. Who are we accountable to? Uh, and it, it turns out that it, in a legacy foundation in particular, like MacArthur, where there is no living donor, the only real accountability is how we define it, and we tend to focus a lot on what the public thinks of us. But that's our choice to focus on what the public thinks of us. So the system of accountability here, if it were a different kind of foundation, might have a different sense of that altogether. So the increasing reliance of nonprofits on ultra high net worth donors contributes to a reduction in community voice because the communities typically are not on the boards of these foundations or not on the group of, they're not part of the families that are making those decisions about ultra high net worth individual funding. Uh, and really also contributes to a reduction in social capital. And one of the things that I found really kind of exciting here is, not exciting, but disturbing, is this particular study uh, that tried to look at the reasons for this secular decline in everyday giving. Among people who stopped giving to charities, the, one of the reasons that they cited for no longer giving was the perception that with the extreme concentration of wealth and the growth in wealth among the very wealthy, that they didn't need to give, that those people had that responsibility. So the ultra-network philanthropy activity actually flows back into the decline overall in secular giving. The other problem with philanthropy currently is that dollars flow inequitably. They do not flow to address systemic issues of poverty. They sometimes flow to respond to immediate needs. And wealthy donors have a track record of parking funds in donor-advised funds and perpetual family foundations. I'm going to spend a moment on donor-advised funds. This is a very, has gotten a lot of attention in the press lately. And so, first of all, for those of, who, of you who are, are not aware of it, this is a vehicle in which a donor can give money to charity by putting it in this account. These accounts may be held at community foundations uh, or some of the big wealth management firms, like Fidelity, have these donor advised funds. You deposit your money there and you take the tax deduction right away because that's considered a charitable contribution. But then there is no, there are no rules about when the money has to go out from the donor advice fund. So the money can sit there for a very long time. And that's one of the challenges with the donor advice funds. They also can kind of mask who the original funder was. And so that's another concern. It could have reduces transparency overall. I'm going to argue a little bit later that I think donor advice funds have a role in the philanthropic practice, even if they need to be uh, read we thought just a bit. But what they also represent is an expression of intent to give because they've basically given the money. And so one of the questions is if you've intended to put the money in the account, why isn't it going out? And I think that's one of those areas where we need additional research overall. And then donors can sometimes give, make funds, make. Uh, funds give away money to situations where they are supporting think tanks, researchers, research institutes. 
that then produce research in support of policies that contribute to the continued aggregation of donor wealth. And that's another practice which some of you may be familiar with, the book Dark Money, that looks at that practice itself. So what I want to do is, before I give you a little bit more of the case study of Lever for Change and our efforts to shift some of this behavior, I want to give you a bit more of context uh, for what's going on. First, just to reinforce what I said earlier, is that we've had a growing concentration of wealth and a growth in the wealth of the wealthiest. Uh, this is just, I've, I looked at like, there's so many different ways people have tried to track what's happened in wealth over time. All of them show the same pattern, that we've seen an uptake in the share of total wealth for the top 0.1% of the population. But what this has also meant, as I hinted before, is that gifts from the wealthy are growing importance in the nonprofit sector. The ultra-wealthy gave a total of $109 billion to philanthropic causes in 2022. That includes the money that went into DAFs and to family found, to private foundations. That's almost 25% more than in 2018. Those who have a net worth of 30 million or more now count for 38% of all individual giving. And if you focus just on the billionaires, the 3,200 billionaires who are around the world, they account for 8% of all individual giving. The second thing, though, that is true about this giving is as much as it's gone up, there is a gap between the aspirations to give, evidence of those aspirations, and I'll point to a couple, and to how much giving is actually happening. Uh, I mentioned the donor-advised funds, which is one metric of intent to give. Uh, the donor-advised funds currently are at $228 billion in those funds. Uh, and so that's one metric. It's $228 billion that effectively has been already given away. I once asked someone, well, if you've given it away, why not give it away to the organizations? And I haven't gotten... a the answer, and so I kind of, um, sometimes my more uh, suspicious, well, I actually have two, two arguments for why it hasn't been given away. One is that I get a little suspicious and think that they think that eventually there'll be a law that lets them take it back out. I don't think that's going to happen. The other, other is that what I've heard is that there, as long as you have a substantial DAF, you are uh, the object of attention from Development officers. I don't think, do we have any from the university here? But, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which one? Community, Community foundations. And so that there's somehow by giving it, actually giving it away, you lose some of your, your status overall as a possible other explanation. But it is a si signal of intent to give. And then the other big signal of intent to give is something called the giving pledge. And the Giving Pledge was something that was started by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, uh, I think it was over 25 years ago now, and the, was the effort to get billionaires to pledge that they would give away half of their wealth by the time they died, or at death. There are now 242 people who have signed the Giving Pledge, they have committed $600 billion, and of that, an estimated $12 billion has been distributed. Compare that to what the estimates are of the growth in their wealth, and they're not keeping up. They're actually, I mean, they're getting wealthier by the day and not giving it away fast enough. And then the other sort of little tidbit here is to look at how money is being given away and who is giving it away. And this is a study that Forbes does of the Forbes top 400 wealthiest people. They hand out philanthropy, they hand out a philanthropy score. And a score of one, which is the lightest color there, means that you have given away less than 1% of your wealth. 
a score of five means that you've given away 20% or more of your wealth. And you can see that the, the score of five is that tiny little wedge on the other side. So again, evidence of a failure to meet the intended or the expressed intention to give. One of the things I will just note, though, is that for many nonprofits, the nonprofit sector itself is a very diverse group of actors. And for many of them, individual giving is not the most important source of support because what they're engaged in is the delivery of services that are usually government funded. And so they get funding from the government to do that. They get fees and so on. So when we talk about this issue of philanthropy and nonprofits, the group of nonprofits that are most reliant on philanthropy tend to be those that are engaged in advocacy, in systems change work, in community organizing, in things that are not otherwise government funded activities themselves. So it's a particular category of nonprofits that we're focusing on. The other thing that's worth noting about these ultra high net worth individuals is what they're giving the money to. In this room, you may be happy to know that much of the giving goes to higher education. And according to research from the Lilly School, the higher education in particular is the hot, biggest recipient of $1 million gifts. These are just $1 million gifts by sector. You'll see the big chunk of that is higher education. Much of that money goes to private institutions, though, and not public institutions. And the other thing that I found pretty interesting is that they began in 1998 to separately track growth to in the dollars going to athletics. And it's been growing pretty rapidly. In 1998, it was approaching the amount going to the academics part of the, of the higher education enterprise. The other big source of where the money is going is to museums and hospitals. And then the last thing I want to note here about this, and this is again the higher, is that philanthropy also has an issue with racial equity. Only a small percentage of philanthropic funding goes to racial equity and an even smaller to racial justice. And the distinction here is that with the money to racial equity, it's largely to ameliorate existing racial inequalities and gaps. And the percentage to social justice is much more support for those who are advocating for systems change. Black, brown, and indigenously led organizations receive less funding and tend to be under-resourced overall. And historically, the decision makers about the distribution of philanthropy, and here I'm including the staff at major foundations, are not black or brown. So the bottom line here is that the current pattern of giving is not mitigating wealth inequality. Higher ed and hospital giving tends to be concentrated in elite institutions that serve the most wealthy. Community-based BIOPOC-led organizations receive disproportionately less funding. And funding does not go to un addressing the underlying causes of some of the problems that we confront the underlying causes of poverty, of income inequality, to systems change or to advocacy. And philanthropy has a particularly weak track record on racial equity. Finally, there's also a pretty strong consensus that it isn't delivering on its promise to be society's risk capital. The experiments of direct redistribution are fairly small, although important, and maybe a good sign overall. But generally speaking, philanthropists are actually pretty risk averse. And this is one of the things that we've learned from the case study. Let me turn now to Lever for Change and tell you a bit about how Lever for Change got started and where, what we have learned from it. So first of all, Lever for Change really emerged from evidence that the ultra high net worth individuals were under giving relative to their stated intentions, what I've already talked about. 
and also a real concern about several practices in philanthropy that seem to reinforce the, uh, reinforce the power that was being held by the individual donors at the expense of communities themselves. We thought that some of the problem, the premise was that the problem might be connected to a market failure. And I use the notion of a market here, recognizing that I am now saying that there's some kind of exchange that donors expect to receive something in exchange for the dollars they give. What economists have argued is that there is a variety of a possible motives for donors to give. Uh, probably one of the better known is the warm glow, that you get happiness from helping others. I think we also recognize that particularly among the ultra high net worth, that some of their giving is a form of self-defense, a recognition that unless you ameliorate some of the conditions of those the least well off, there will be political unrest and a threat to their own wealth position. It's also the case that for some donors, they are, view the giving as a consumption good. They get some direct benefit from the charitable activity. One can argue, I think, that this explains some of the giving to higher education, which is largely driven by alums. When I have talked to ultra high net worth individual donors, well, I didn't change that. <laughs> when I've talked to ultra individual high net worth donors, they'll talk about, well, I give money to my kid's private school. Uh, I give money, one of the, internationally, one of the big areas that the donors are giving to is sports. So at first I thought that was the stadiums at institutions and so on. But no, it's to nonprofits that basically are providing the sports facilities that they then use to play with. So all of those are examples of consumption good uses of it. And then I think the other important piece, and one that we've certainly observed, is that giving can also be part of a construction of your social identity. Historically, one of the famous of the examples of that is Andrew Carnegie and his donations to create libraries around the country as a way of, well, now we call it greenwashing when people do this on the environmental side, but this was an early form of that to remake his image overall. We also have a fairly complex group of donors, donors with multiple vehicles for giving, legacy institutions, living donor foundations, individuals. But the other big piece, and the one that I think is least well understood, is that when you ask donors why they're not giving, and I was once had an opportunity to speak to a group of young people who had, had just recently had what is called a wealth event. And a wealth event means that they basically, they were part of some startup tech company and it got purchased and now they suddenly have a lot of wealth, so a wealth event. So this was a workshop, a seminar for them about how to get going in philanthropy. And, and what was really surprising to me is the most common word that I heard was, it's so overwhelming. And what they meant by that was that they felt that they didn't have a lot of information about what the opportunities were or where they should give. And they had a, a really strong sense of failure, of, of concern about making a mistake and giving money to the wrong place. They tended to see giving to nonprofits as riskier than giving to a museum or a university, which I understand. But they also seem to see giving to nonprofits riskier than investing in a startup. Their demand for information from nonprofits uh, was a much higher set of criteria than what it appears that they have done for many startups and new ventures. And I say that because we have some big examples where people did not seem to collect a lot of information in that space. They also simultaneously, though, seemed unwilling to pay for information to improve the effectiveness of their giving. It had a tendency to drive a lot of their decision making based on, and this goes back, I think, to the construction of social identity, where are my friends giving and who do I know? And one prime example of that is I had a conversation where a donor had defined a set of really tight rules around which they would make gifts. 
but they had made a gift that clearly didn't align with those top rules. For example, many donors now want randomized control trials. So that should make the economists happy because there's more work for economists to do randomized control trials. But this particular gift, there had not been a randomized control trial. And I kind of asked, well, well why did you give there? And they had gone to the same prep school. Um, in Decolonizing Wealth, Edgar Villanueva's book, he quotes someone who talks about the, the attraction to the, the shiny object, to the very charismatic leader that is one of the ways in which that seems to go against their notion of risk aversion and the amount of information. But they basically are willing to rely on signals overall. So in that context, what we thought was that we might be able to shift behavior by trying to reduce this information asymmetry. And um, I wanted to say just a little bit more about the ways in which this information problem manifests itself in the forms of giving. I mentioned the attraction to the shiny or the person they know, but it meant that most donors, and this includes big foundations like MacArthur, rely on invitation-only grant processes. Now, I did not know this before I got to MacArthur, and I, when I realized this, I thought about all the time as a faculty member, I sent off letters, and they were not going to go anywhere. It was, it was interesting to learn this later, but they only, they only will do invitation only so that they control the process. They give to known entities, large institutions, individuals in their close network. They give very constrained gifts that limit the activities of the nonprofits, and they make those gifts very small. The average gift in philanthropy is $50,000 over 18 months. You're really not going to make big headway on some of the big problems that we face with $50,000 over 18 months. They tend to favor activities with very quantifiable and observable inputs and outputs. And hence, health is usually a very attractive because you can kind of measure how many people receive the vaccine, or you can measure what the reduction in the disease was overall. And they just overall give less. The consequences for nonprofits is that they end up devoting a lot of resource to the search for funding, that they tend to be looking from year to year to funding. And when you're on a year to year funding cycle, that affects what you do, what your plans are, your willingness to experiment. And so what we wanted to do when we, when we started Lever for Change was to kind of see if we couldn't nudge philanthropists away from this pattern in order to give nonprofits a bigger space in which to make change happen. We were not alone in this space, as with many markets that have information asymmetries, there have emerged an array of intermediaries. There are brokers and advisors, independent evaluators. Many of the big wealth management companies have introduced a philanthropic advisory service, which is where those donor advised funds are sitting and waiting to be dispersed. Uh, but there are also a move towards creating donor collaboratives that will bring together multiple donors with the idea that if they gave together collectively, you would both have uh, more sense that you've gotten and made a good decision because it's a group decision, but also that it kind of creates a group dynamic and contributes to a social identity aspect of it that turns out to be important. And I've seen this where donors, particularly donors who perceive themselves as, as lower in the hierarchy among the very wealthy, like to join a collaborative where some of the big names are located themselves. But what we decided to do at Lever for Change was something a little different. All right, so what we do is we replace invitation-only grant making with an open call, an open call for submissions. We then have developed a process that involves external voices, because we're trying to expand the array of individuals who get to have a say in how money is distributed. We also have a participatory stage in our grant processes, so we expand the range of voices to get to make decisions. Out of that process arises some top performing applications, 
The donor gets to pick the one that they're going to fund from among those top performing ones. So we're trying to address by having a fairly rigorous process of evaluation, we're trying to reduce the perceived riskiness of those investments. The donor decides what they're going to fund. And then we take the other good ideas and we get them in front of other funders because they've been pre-vetted, they've gone through this, this process. It's reducing the cost of information acquisition for those. We have found that this is starting to work. We have seen that by opening the philanthropic, giving more opportunities to more organizations, that we are getting ideas that are new and bold. We have an independent va a panel who evaluates the ideas that come in and that do well in our challenges. And they have concluded that we are finding really ideas that other funders would not have funded necessarily. We are finding ideas that are uncommon in terms of, of what, how you solve problems. We are finding individuals who are organizations with leadership that's BIPOC and from the community itself. We are moving money. Oh, now it's going backwards. OK. So I mentioned earlier, we have moved 2.2 billion uh, and have unlocked it from a large number of donors. That number has actually gone up from 122. 44% of the projects have been rated bold or uncommon. 60%, I'm sorry, 60% are bold and uncommon. 44% have approximate leadership, leadership from the communities they serve. And for many of the organizations, it's the first time that they have had a large, significant grant of five million or more. So we have been successful, but we've also, oh, let me also just mention a few of the examples because I like to talk about them just to bring this to home. Uh, one of the challenges that we ran on behalf of, of two donors was a challenge to find, to find, to prepare solutions that would give durable futures for refugees. And the recipient of that was a group called the Resourcing Refugee, Refugee Leadership Initiative. It's the first ever global coalition of organizations representing refugees. They're from all parts of the globe. Five organizations have come together they're doing really two things. One is that they've created a fund to support other smaller refugee-led organizations around the world. And they are act organizing themselves to rep be a refugee voice in international policymaking, where refugee voices have historically been underrepresented. And this one was actually a really interesting case study because the donor initially was going to go a different direction. Uh, in the decision about the gift. And the conversation that we were able to have to point out that what he defined as what was important to him in giving a gift was best matched by this organization, helped push him away from funding what had been a big name organization that lots of people know about to this particular initiative. We've had a gift that was given through the Chicago Prize. Uh, that what I think represented another important shift in giving because the effort was to identify interventions in the south and southwest sides of Chicago, the historically uh, most under-resourced communities. And what they wanted were plans that were already in place in those communities and community plans that they could identify and fund. And they ended up giving a gift to the Auburn Gresham neighborhood that has resulted in a new healthcare center in the neighborhood and a biodigester and an urban farm. And then the Kellogg Foundation, in its Racial Equity 2030 challenge, uh, just made a couple of grants that I think really stand out. One is the Indian Land Rights um, Organization that's focused on indigenous people around the world creating a system of access to legal services in order to be able to defend their land rights. And then one that particularly I liked was a group to action aid to introduce anti-racist education in Brazil's public schools. What's noteworthy on that particular one is that the racial equity 2030 was a global call 
And the ambition of some of the projects that came from outside of the United States were striking because they were open to creative and to ideas that focused on let's look at how we can change the systems, how we can change those who are in power versus focusing on how we might change the individuals who have been marginalized themselves. So those are just a few examples of the kinds of projects that have come out. And as I said, we're really, we're proud of that. But if you think about it, I'm proud of $2 billion. And you will remember how much funding, I said, was already just sitting around in those DAF accounts. That was 220 some billion just in the current year. So $2 billion is just a drop in that bucket overall. We have not found the secret sauce. When I look at the donors that we have who've worked with us, uh, they are donors who, by and large, were already giving. Many of the donors, I mentioned earlier, the growth in these intermediaries, like the collaborative funds. When we sit down and compare notes together, it's the same donors across all of them. So there is still a lot of money sitting around in DAVs, sitting around in the giving pledge that we are not tapping into. We have shifted where the funding is going. I think that's pretty exciting. So we've taken the existing donor funding and shifted it in ways that more democratize the giving. Uh, one of the recent examples of that is that we were working with Mackenzie Scott um, on her yield giving open call. She had, in prior giving, which she has been incredibly generous, has been giving away money in a process that was kind of like you got tapped on the shoulder and handed a large grant. But working with us, she decided to do an open call. She committed to $251 million grants. In the end, after she saw the amazing wealth of nonprofit organizations deserving of support, she was focused on those between one and five million, she ended up giving out $640 million. So we're shifting the way those donors are giving, but we're still not tapping in to those, much of that funding that's sitting on the sidelines. So if one of the issues for me is how do we understand better how to move that money or whether it wants to be moved? And that, I think, is, is one of the things I, want, I would love to think about how we research it more. So I'm just going to recap my, my current pattern of giving and then say a little bit about why sometimes I, I want to I question whether or not, you know, I, I'm, I've, we've done most of this with the idea that people do want to give because there is evidence of intent to give. Um, but the first is, as I said earlier, as you've seen, we're not giving away enough money to really mitigate the effects of wealth inequality or, or concentration. And where the money is going is still heavily towards institutions that um, largely are supportive of, that, that actually may amplify some of the impacts of that wealth. We have shown that it's possible to shift where people give, but we're not really unlocking new capital. We can't rule out that secret sauce. And so what we need to know, where there needs to be some more work done, is to understand the behavior of the rich. Now, economists have focused on issues like poverty by studying the behavior of the poor, and issues like pay gaps by studying workers. But we rarely turn that lens around. I mean, recently there has been more work studying the behavior of employers, but in, in much of the research on the effects of race, it's the focus is on those people who are minoritized and not on those who might be exercising discriminatory patterns. In this case, much of the focus on giving has focused on what nonprofits do to solicit the gifts and not so much on what the behavior of the givers might be. So this is a space where we could use more work on the policy changes that are needed 
that could accelerate or increase total giving. We need, this could involve, for example, rethinking what constitutes a charitable deduction. It can involve restructuring the deduction itself. So for example, it could be that you may want to limit what it is that counts as a charitable deduction. Right now, the US has one of the broadest definitions of what counts as a charitable deduction in the world. And we need more work to understand a little bit more about this focus on risk. Is it really risk as we think about it, that there's a risk something bad is going to happen? Or is it a cover story for not wanting to give it all? That, for me, is one of the big questions that I'm hoping we can explore some more over the next few years. In closing, though, I want to just repeat something important. My approach here has been that there is an opportunity to engage in a form of philanthropy that could mitigate some of the consequences of the concentration of wealth. It's not that philanthropy is going to be a panacea. Sort of taking from a starting point as we have this wealth concentration, we lack the political will to do anything by fiat, what can we get through this other vibrant sector of philanthropy and nonprofits? And I'm happy now to talk and get, take questions. Thank you. Uh, my question is about three words that you used, highly rated projects. About eight years ago with the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, two heads of colleges bemoaned the fact that 80% of the giving from us donors was restricted to our pet projects. And their greatest need was unrestricted giving. Out of the 2.2 billion that you've been the catalyst for placing, there's a lot there about highly rated projects. How much of it went to highly rated organizations? Yeah, that's a really good question because it is true that most of what we have done has been project-based, with the exception of the most recent yield giving open call, where that 640 million was general operating support unrestricted. But one of the things we've done in the construction of these open calls is that we insist that the donor define some big problem area they're interested in and not put any real restrictions on the nature of the work that's done to reach that. So for the nonprofits, they've been able to define what their strategy will be and what work they will do and how they will do it. So it's in very flexible funding, even though it's still project. It's also the case that some of it is, much of the ones who end up participating, are collaborations among nonprofits. So uh, one of the things we've learned is that if you if you offer a large grant for multiple years, and our minimum grant commitment is $10 million over five years, uh, if you offer that, then nonprofits will actually work together in ways that they haven't always. And so the, the, the giving is actually set up to be quite flexible. The case of the Chicago example, I had someone come up to me once and say, well, I knew those nonprofits already. They were already known. There wasn't any real discovery. You didn't cover, you didn't uncover some new organizations, but we'd never seen them work together before. So, so there's a way in which the, the grant is structured to maximize flexibility even when it's a project grant. Thank you very much for an excellent, excellent presentation. Can I have the PowerPoint presentation or the book or the paper and so on? That was, yeah, it was really good. Um, just to give a background, um, coming, the questions I'm, I'm going to ask are coming from my interest in the area of development aid yes. and effectiveness, but also my interest, practical interest in the world of NGOs, smaller than the ones you're talking about. So my first one is, I don't know if you know, you have seen uh, any evidence on differences across countries, um, economies, groups, in terms of propensity to give. Are, are they 
do, do we see more giving in some countries more than others? Is that what does it what would be causing the difference? Second is in, in think about what incentivizes people to give. What is the what is the role of results? Yes. And here I'm going to give you again an, an uh, illustration. I'm, I'm a member of, of the board of an NGO in Burundi that uh, assists in, in the areas of health and education. And last year, um, they, uh, the organization opened a new hospital. And at the opening, they had invited some of the donors, members of the, of the board, to come and assist and, and participate in it. And the testimonies when they of these donors when they came back were, were amazing. Some, for some of them, it was the first time they go to Burundi. And I could feel a big sense of pride in what they have done in giving, giving, uh, being part of the, of the organization. So how do you link the results to incentives to giving? Thanks. So I'm gonna start with that last part because I think when we look at the donors who are actively involved in the sort of thing that I'm talking about, uh, there is a, a very strong interest in impact, and that is where the warm glow comes from. So, you know, the, the visit, the site visit becomes important, even though site visits are kind of have some controversy associated with them. But it is, it is clearly for a subset of donors, they, want, they do this because they want to see the world be better, and they vary in how detailed they want to be about the impact. There's some controversy around this as well, because... Um, the, I mentioned before the donors who will only give if there's been a randomized control trial. Uh, there are some donors who were, are, are much looser about that. They recognize that that would exclude a lot of problems that we don't really do randomized control studies of, but also can, can um, exclude a lot of organizations that um, are, don't have the resources to do randomized control. So there is a strong interest in impact overall, but there's a lot more among the donors that we've been working with, a lot more care about how you, what you demand in terms of evidence of impact. Uh, the, you mentioned at the beginning that you were dealing with smaller NGOs than what we're talking about. One of the other things we've really enforced with donors, though, is that some of the ones who have gotten our $10 million grants are not large NGOs, as I mentioned. over. Uh, half of them have never had a grant of five million or more for you know any period of time. Many of them have never had a grant above one million before, uh, and in particularly that is true for some of the grantees in our global challenges. I didn't mention a group that won one of our, our maternal infant health award recently, uh, which is a group of of, of women, a Kenyan-founded women's organization working on maternal health, that ended up getting a ten million dollar grant through this. Now, you're asking a question about propensity to give. Uh, there's pretty strong evidence that U.S., at least among the ultra-high net worth, are the most likely to be engaged in giving, and that's true both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Most of global philanthropic dollars are coming from the U.S. That just reflects the concentration of wealth, I think, more than anything. Uh, the, in terms of everyday givers, there is some just emerging evidence that's coming out of work that Giving Tuesday does. So you're all familiar with the Giving Tuesday initiative, which started for, you know, let's get a lot of people to give a couple days after Thanksgiving. This is now a global network of nonprofits, and it's not always on that same day, but they are collecting data from all the organizations who participate, and it's going to be able to give us some real insights into what everyday givers look like around the world. Uh, so I hesitate to make a specific claim about the U.S. than other places without having more of that data available. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you, first of all. It's a, a brilliant presentation. Um, the, I, I've taught a course that looks at the role of government and nonprofits in a market economy, and it's just how you started in terms of economics of allocating um, allocating scarce resources. And the way I sort of present it um, is there's the markets at, at one extreme, and then there's government at another extreme, but that nonprofits, to me, I look at really sort of quasi-market participants, that they, um, I mean, what, one, one thing I need to um, dissuade my students at the beginning is they think, oh, nonprofits, they have it easy because they don't have to worry about money. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is, you know, how do you pay electricity, employees, and all that sort of thing. So nonprofits need money, and so just as, uh, you know, in the open market, if you sell something that's good and good quality and inexpensive, then you succeed and, you know, you, whatever. So that's the same sort of approach that I see a lot of nonprofits doing, where they may have a mission, but they need the money. And so, you know, I have concerns, as, as you've um, pointed out, about how big donors can set the, uh, the incentive for nonprofits and really direct how resources are allocated. So I'm wondering if you view sort of levers for change or are there other ways to increase the accuracy of the market signals, increase the accuracy of what lead nonprofits to do the things they do, what pro nonprofits succeed, and then what projects they undertake. Is, is that one way of looking at what, what Levers for Change does? One of the things that we've, we've been doing with Ed Lever for Change is that the, um, we now have, because we've run 11, 12 challenges to date, we've got a database right now of over 6,000 initiatives, I put it, more organizations represented than that. And I think there's an opportunity there to extract some information that can be valuable about, first of all, what the nature of solutions are in different problems area and what they cost. And so one of the things that, that I'm going to pick up a little bit on what you said, and then you could tell me if I've, I've missed your question, but there is this push from some parts of the donor community, not all, that nonprofits should ultimately figure out a way to survive on revenues that they have gotten for the work that they're doing, that they should be able to survive on um, fees. And, and as I've put up here, many nonprofits are being supported by fees, but that turns out to be a subset of ones that are basically doing work on government contract that otherwise the government would do, like running a work your training program or running some other kind of program itself. But many other nonprofits, it's not clear because the nonprofit exists because there's a market failure. And so the question is, why would you then expect the market to be able to, to step in? So that's a, a conversation we end up having with donors a lot about to what extent is there a fee that the nonprofit could charge or something that they could gain revenue from um, to continue. So the other piece that I'll note is that there is a big donor. We, we require, gosh, I almost hesitate, well, universities are different because universities have these negotiated overhead rate, rates with the government itself, but the private sector has typically capped the cost of overhead and administration for nonprofits at 10 or 15%. But there have been recent studies that shown that the true cost is more like 25 to 30 percent. So a donor who works with us has to build, has to allow for 25 to 30 percent for to cover the overhead costs, because there's been a kind of impoverishing of organizations if they do the project. This goes back to the project versus operating, uh, that they can't actually, that, you know, that they're losing money overall on it. So we try to do a lot of donor education in the, in the work that we do, and we have a few rules. If you're going to work with us, you have to do this. Does that get at what you were? Uh, yeah, th though I, I think that part of the, when I've talked about nonprofits being in the market is it isn't selling services. So there are food banks and things like that where mm -hmm. there's just not money coming in. Right. And so um, the education, I, th I think it, the education that you're doing sh can can steer them to uh, provide those services that the market is, that the general market is, isn't providing. So I, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. To Good. recognize that, that, that this is not something that the market's going to step up and do. Yeah. Thank you. A, a question about the 3.8% uh, or 3.6% up there. Uh, eight years ago, when I turned 62, I realized I was in the last third of my life. Up until then, I gave annual gifts. Haven't given one since. It's all gone to the endowment. You haven't addressed endowment and whether or not you balance the strength of an organization, an endowment base, and general operating uh, comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a vibrant conversation right now about endowments. Most 
of the nonprofits engaged in this kind of what I'll call social change work do not have endowments, and they don't, have not typically gotten gifts for endowments, but there's currently a move afoot to have more, not only to have more gifts in the form of, of general operating support, but have more gifts in the form of endowment support for these nonprofits. Now, this is in, in the context of a general question about whether philanthropic giving should be allowed. There's others who argue that everything should be spent every year, even for the foundation. So there's, there's some tension here. But the idea is that by giving them endowment support, one is that you have a little bit of a safety net when you know, the, the giving goes down because the world's gone bad, but in the meantime, the demand for your food and the kitchen or whatever has gone up. Uh, there's an argument that it gives you the space to experiment, which many nonprofits can't test different approaches to solving a problem because they don't have the ability to, um, they, they have to do what the donor says, and this goes back to the fact that donors are remarkably risk averse. Um, and then it also gives the nonprofit a bit of freedom in terms of being able to do things that maybe donors don't want to fund. So there's a push currently for, for more endowment support. But it's just, it's just, in the past two months, there's been three articles, so it's starting to be a buzz. I'm coming from a different direction. Um, I really appreciated your talk. I learned a lot from it. But um, I also feel like there's a certain backfire in play and the backfire is this. Um, after what you've said, I have a hard time understanding why we should have a charitable tax deduction. Uh, and uh, especially given your information about the distribution of the funds, where they're coming from, and what they're going to. And um, I wonder if a sort of ferocious analysis of how uh, the charitable deduction has actually made things worse and people might actually rise up against it for that reason, might help you change the behavior of donors. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so I will say this, I, and I'm, I'm reserving judgment on the charitable tax deduction. I used, to, I used to, because I had gone through economics graduate school where it was taught to me as a bad thing, I used to think it should go away. Um, I understand a little bit differently how it affects what I'll call the everyday giver. And so I'm wondering if it shouldn't have its structure flipped so that, you know, almost like, is it the mortgage one where there's a cap? So, so that's something I've been thinking a little bit about. And then the other part of it is the, um, it would, if you did that, I think it would immediately you wouldn't see the money going into DAS on a year-to-year -year basis. And that means it wouldn't be just accumulating, which is a negative. But on the other hand, it does sometimes get paid out. And so I'm, I'm, I'm still on the fence about the charitable deduction is my answer. But yes, I, I'm, I think the donors that I'm working with are probably not influenced that much by it. <laughs> But the ones who are influenced by it are the ones who have the money sitting around. So there could be an argument for getting rid of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm still, I'm, I'm, I haven't made up my mind on it yet. <laughs> okay. Over here. Over here. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you as well for uh, presenting tonight, and I also wanted to thank the economics department for hosting this, and especially for advertising it on NEPM, so those of us who don't work in academia learn about it and can attend it. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, uh, and I should probably mention disclaimer, I, I studied in the uh, economics department at UMass for a bit, um, uh, so I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, and I've been in the nonprofit sector for the last almost 30 years. Uh, so I find this very fascinating. I'm interested by it. And when I step back from the conversation a little bit and think about the three ways that wealth can, or avenues through which wealth can support the public good, it seems like there are th at least three. Government, obviously. Uh, the second, through um, uh, the category of high worth uh, donors who are willing to give, and then those who are 
holding out uh, in, in different ways for different reasons. And, I'm, and I think it's really important that you're focusing on that, uh, perhaps the, the low-hanging fruit, uh, the high-worth donors who want to give and uh, incentivizing them and helping them steer it to uh, projects that are, are worthy of that and are going to have a, a, a social impact, a positive social impact on uh, equity and um, uh, social justice, et cetera, et cetera, in, in the eyes of the beholder at least. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, uh, Levers for Change is considering tackling the, the, those other two areas of, of a high worth giving, whether it's uh, through, the, uh, through government revenue, through taxation, uh, or uh, by in some way uh, advocating for policy change to, to leverage uh, giving from those high worth donors who aren't giving. Um, and I wouldn't want us to give up completely uh, on um, uh, uh, government uh, support for the public good uh, when we think that it, it's uh, uh, we can't it, we can't be successful that way. I, um, and, and of course, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is a perfect example of that. We were able to institute what, what is commonly t referred to as the, the millionaire's tax, uh, and that surcharge has resulted in three billion extra dollars to the state coffers uh, that I'd like to think, at least in the Commonwealth, much of it is in fact going uh, for the public, to the public good, uh, education and transportation. So um, I'll take that in, in a couple parts. First of all, you know, lever for change is itself a 501c3. So we, we are limited in terms of, of lobbying or for any particular policy change. We can produce information, and that's one of the things I was alluding to is, is we've, we've now got a body of evidence that may be useful in informing some of these decisions, and that's one of the things that we hope to produce. But we are, um, we're limited in, in what we can do in that regard. Um, I'll note that this goes back to our conversation earlier about global giving. One of the things that's been happening around the world is, is, um, is arguably autocratic governments have taken hold. One of the, the first things they've done is tried to restrict the charitable sector. And I'm mentioning that only because I'm, I'm, I want to thread the needle a little bit. I think I don't find that it's mutually exclusive to have significant private philanthropy and a significant tax on the wealthy. And I think you know, that those things are not mutually exclusive, and there is quite a bit of money still to go around. So, I mean, that's, that's the other thing, given these levels of wealth. So I would say that those two things are not mutually exclusive, and, but I'm a little hesitant to, and this is, this is why I've been struggling with how you define the charitable tax deduction, I'm a little hesitant with giving too much power uh, to dictate what the private philanthropy should look like on the part of the government. There, I, it's one of the things I've been thinking a lot about. How do you write a rule that, that, that protects the very real role that private philanthropy can play in supporting a, 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 a sector that holds the government accountable? <laughs> and that's, that's where I'm sort of, yeah, you know, I, I personally think we could do more work on the government taxation side, but I'm a little bit cautious on the other side of, of directing where giving goes. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I want to echo everybody else's thanks uh, for coming and, and for sharing uh, so much of your work, uh, working at the Community Foundation. This, it inf very informative um, and a little inspiring, uh, motivational. And I should say, community foundations around the country were so helpful in the Yield Giving Open Call in getting the word out to their organizations about that opportunity. I think we almost, we really, we had initially estimated that there were 7,200 7, organizations that fit the eligibility criteria, and we ended up getting applications from 6,000. So that's a pretty good reach. <laughs> yeah, we try to play that role, <laughs> that intermediary. Um, and, and so much of what you shared really applies directly to our, even our day-to-day -day work. Um, but uh, I, I did have a notion to talk on this tax code thing. I almost didn't want to make a comment, but because it's in the air, um, there's an article, Vox.com, um, within the last couple of days, I think, oh, um, related to what they do in the UK. Um, and apparently it is 
it is uh, an example of a flip where a donor would give 100% of whatever they choose to give to whichever agency, and the government matches up to 25%. Um, we try to tackle the tax code here in the United States. We're wrestling with a behemoth, but, um, but you're, you're nodding, so you're familiar. I wonder if you'd share any thoughts on that and you know, how, it, how it aligns with some of what you're grappling with. Yeah, I, I have, I'm not deeply familiar with this, but, but I've been thinking about the match idea as a way of, of directing, having the funding, kind of have, using it as a form of citizen input about where money should be going. Um, but I have to read some more on that. because That's why I was nodding. It's because I, I just, just today wrote the word match on a piece of paper and said, think about this. So. Uh, Vox.com, April 15th. OK, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. That was a really wonderful talk. I learned a lot. Um, so I had, um, actually, if it's okay, two questions. Uh, the first is you mentioned about the problems with, uh, or, you know, that RCTs and, you know, having like quantifiable metrics to look at impact are important to donors. And I was wondering if you talk a little bit more about if you're seeing that there are certain social problems that are not being addressed because you just can't measure in you know in, in the in the longer term what the or the, sorry in the shorter or medium term what the impacts are um, so that's the first question and the second question is if we're thinking about you know trying to get more uh, you know donation you know donors to to, to give their their money um, we need also these good you know good people to work in the organizations that are doing the work and that's something that I wanted to bring it back to what the Chancellor brought up at the beginning about our students and I think you know if we look at a lot of our students you know they're really focused on you know they in economics or in, you know in the business school that they um, you know job in finance or you know getting a well-paying job and I'm kind of I'm wondering if you're seeing anything about you know students are motivated though by helping their communities having social impact impact and um, you know what are kind of the skills or ways you think that we can motivate students to, to get involved in these organizations as a career if you think that's a good path forward um, so I I think I'm, I'm oops I'm at a nonprofit <laughs> it is um, a fulfilling uh, work I have lots of young people working with me um, I think the and the path there can be from multiple directions um, I have young people working with me who started in the for-profit sector and then moved over. Uh, I have people who have been themselves, like started their own nonprofits and then that kind of, you know, had it ran its course and now they're working for us where we're trying to support other nonprofits. Uh, what I think is exciting about it as a field is it really, there is a really strong demand for the kinds of skills that are being developed at a place like UMass Amherst. Uh, there's a strong need for critical analysis, for writing, for communications, um, and there. And it's such a diverse array. I mean, one of the great things about the work I've been doing recently is that um, I have learned a lot about how geothermal in, in, um, energy can be used in industry, and how marine protected areas can protect oceans and some really successful strategies to decrease, to, in, to decrease the number of homeless in cities, and an early childhood program, I didn't even talk about that. Our, one of our very first grants we facilitated was to Sesame Workshop and the International Rescue Committee for an intervention in the Syrian refugee region. And there's now a new television show that was locally developed that's in Arabic, and uh, all of those things. And there is a, a way in which there is a level of gratification for feeling like you had a teeny part <laughs> in all of those kinds of things that I, I, I think makes it a particularly worthwhile career to pursue. There are opportunities to volunteer, uh, and there's even some formal kinds of networks to provide specific skills. There's a group called Catch a Fire. There's some others where if, for example, you're a really good graphic designer, you can offer your services up to nonprofits. Um, and they really need those services sometimes. So it, it's something I would, I, I think it's a great path for students to think about. Hi. Um, just want to echo what everybody else has said. Thank you so much for coming here and talking to us. And thank you to UMass for opening this up to the public. Um, 
I've worked in nonprofits for almost eight years um, after escaping from academia. Um, and I work in development. And um, I'm currently getting my uh, certificate in fundraising management from the L Lilly Family School. Oh, um, okay. And one of the, the courses I'm taking right now, uh, it, there's, there was a discussion in the discussion forum about DAFs. And a question I had, um, which maybe you can answer, is um, how much knowledge control say do DAF donors have over the way that that money is invested? I know that um, you know large these large financial firms who control a lot of this DAF money has lobbied really hard against more regulation in how DAF money is distributed and how much of it is distributed, how frequently it is distributed, and I'm curious also um, if the, the way that the money is invested is sometimes counterproductive to the charitable goals that the DAF donors have, such as, say, being invested in oil companies or weapons manufacturers um, or other things that are actively destroying maybe the things that their charitable interests are aligned with. So the quick answer is I don't know. A little bit, a bit, some pieces that I'm curious about and that I think that there is some more research for it. So there's two sides of donor control. There's donor control over how the money is invested. And, and I suspect they probably have some more control over that, uh, legitimate control over that, than they do over how the money is distributed. So those two things are, are big question marks. Technically, the donor is supposed to have given the money away and uh, there's supposed to be some definition of how the money should be spent, but not dictating to whom it should be go. go. That's my understanding of how the rules are for that side of it. But my experience is that, no, I think actually there's a lot of, rule of say they have over exactly where the money should go. So I think there, there is a, a, a space there to get a better understanding of how much say the donor continues to have over the DAF on that side. And on the investment side, it's a good question. I, I don't know, as I said in the beginning, how much they get to dictate how the money's invested, because usually it's, in, it's invested in some big you know, entity that's managing it. Maybe the people from community foundations that have DAFs know a bit more about that. But uh, that part I don't know. Thanks. Would you like an answer? Yes. <laughs> um, so a donor establishing a fund or a donor designated fund does have the option to, to dictate to us how they want that invested. We offer two main options. One is a global growth fund that is essentially a, a, you know, follows the stock market at large and then it's a, a, um, a sustainable a sustainable program that allows, it, that more or less leaves out spoiling gas. Yeah. just add one of the things about DAFs that I've been learning as I've been digging into them a bit more is that they are not exclusively a tool of the very rich. I mean, they're, they're the, 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 yeah, $10,000 minimum. And so they're a way of accumulating, like I, after I listened to someone talk about DAFs, I thought, well, maybe I should have had one. You know, you could put the money in the DAF for year after year, and then you actually have enough to give a gift to your college that your college will notice. <laughs> that kind of thing. I mean, it, it, it actually, I think, is a tool that does have some, some, some useful purposes. <laughs> OK. No further questions? Then I would like to thank Dr. Sue Conrad for coming this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for coming. All right. And good evening. <laughs>